Hello, you fine students of the Book of Ruth. This is our Lenten series for 2021, uh, moving toward Easter. And I must say that the, the Book of Ruth is, is really something else. Now, I know that um, we all are familiar with the story, but when you really get into the text of it, you begin to see how radical it really is. And so um, as we gather, let's open with prayer. Loving Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be together in whatever manner we may be streaming in. We thank you for your word that is new every morning, that speaks to us in fresh and vibrant ways as a living document. We are grateful to see through this book how you work with your people and how with your guidance it can turn to good. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are picking up where we left off last week uh, with chapter one, and we are moving into chapter two, which kind of lays the next chapter out. It's like four different scenes that we are experiencing here in the book of Ruth. Now, several of you asked some very good questions or made some nice comments about your perspective of what is happening in the story. One of you pointed out um, quite vividly that Ruth and Naomi were traveling back to Judea, to Bethlehem, the house of bread, um, and it was dangerous on the road. Two women, maybe they had traveled with a group of people who were going to Bethlehem, and often uh, people who were traveling along the road would, but with people like Ruth and Naomi, highly um, vulnerable as two women without any men or redeemer protectors. Um, it had to have been kind of nerve wracking, but they made it. They were guided by the Lord and they um, were making their way and they made it and they made it. But you know, grief is a terrible thing. And one of the things that I don't really know if I really stressed enough, um, they both went along. This is in verse, let's see, verse 19 in chapter one. So both of them went along until they arrived at Bethlehem. And when they arrived at Bethlehem, the whole town was excited on account of them. And this is interesting. And the women of the town asked, can this be Naomi? Now we know that they had lived in Moab for some time had been received graciously and, and were farmers in all likelihood, and they had sustenance and nourishment, and they lived among what many would consider their enemies. And now they're coming back. But grief and, and the hardness of life at that moment, they, they didn't recognize Naomi right away. It was like, could, could this be her? It looks kind of like her. And you know how it is if you haven't seen someone for a long time and you go, whoa, <laughs> that's who it is. But um, it was interesting that she replied to them, don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara. Naomi means gift of joy. Mara means bitterness. So you have these extremes and the bitterness has obviously shown um, shown up on her face and on her uh, features. And she blames God, that's really great, um, for the Almighty has made me very bitter. Okay, what I like about that is she's not rejecting God. She's angry with God. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed that before in reading this, she blames God. Well, we like things to make sense. There's got to be a reason for it, right? We talked about this a little bit in our study of Job, but um, because the Lord has returned me empty, um, or another word for empty there is barren, um, meaning no males. Why would we? you call me Naomi? What would you call me joyful when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has deemed me guilty? All right. So for those of you out there who are really struggling and who are angry 
have experienced great tragedy and loss and are thinking maybe you shouldn't be angry with God, this human nature to want to make sense of something, even if it's something we don't like, blame God. Do you know, I think he's probably big enough to take our anger um, and even suggest that he turned away from them. That's an excuse. Well, you weren't paying attention to me. Come on, Lord, come on. So I, I think that's uh, very telling and very real. I, it's real. Um, then thus Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, returned with her. Now, something that's very interesting about Ruth in this switch is she was a Moabite woman named Ruth. Okay, she, she was Ruth. That was her name. However, when they get to Judea, Ruth all of a sudden is no longer just Ruth. She is Ruth the Moabitist. Okay. In other words, she's a foreigner. She's an immigrant. Okay. But at least she was married to a sickly man, but there's nothing to suggest that her husband had been um, a, a bad husband. He was just very sickly. Now, this is a telling word as well. In the beginning, first verse of chapter 2, now, Naomi had a respected relative, a man of worth, through her husband from the family of Elimelech. Remember, that's her husband's name, who is now dead. So she comes back, and it's very important uh, to be in um, a body of people who are of the same tribe, so to speak who work the same land as we have it. And so we hear a little bit about here, but her name changes. Ruth the Moabitist said to Naomi, let me go to the field. Now this is of her father-in-law, Elimelech's um, heritage. Let me go to the field so that I may glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose eyes I might find favor. Now, harvesting was often done by servants or slaves um, or people who were like migrant workers who would come through the fields during harvest time and, and, and collect the harvest and they would be paid that way. Um, Ruth didn't really have any connection other than the fact that she was a foreigner and her mother-in-law was, of, um, of was a Hebrew woman. So, um, hmm, okay, oh, this is a neat thought. Remember, this is from a class that I took um, in fall on the Book of Ruth from Columbia Theological Seminary, which is an amazing um, opportunity for continued learning and scripture study. It's, it's geared more toward preachers, but um, anybody can take it, and I'm trying to, to put it into language that all of us can understand and relate to. But we have to have to, to say, what are, what are the assumptions that we bring to this text, especially as we move into chapter two? Um, we have to remember that this is a cross-cultural story. We have Moabites and we have um, Bethlehemites, if we want to call them that. Um, it's cross-cultural. And that is a key part of this book in that Ruth, the, the, Mo, the Moabite woman, Ruth, is now... Ruth the Moabite, meaning that's her identity, but that's, but she's more than that, and people don't quite know what to label her. Um, so, see, it's, it's hard to get into the um, context of the era in which this is taking place, um, remembering that as we read this, we bring our own experiences into it. Are you an immigrant? Now, in America, most of us are immigrants. We just don't want to admit it. <laughs> Those new people coming in who don't look quite like us, now they, oh, we don't want them. No, they're immigrants. And so this is about immigration and how we are received. Um, let's see. Oh, but uh, one thing to note in this is how we're received, but not just by individuals, but how are we received by the whole community? Um, I think about immigrants on the border. 
who have been pretty much imprisoned over the last few years and separated from their children, that's hard. These are immigrants. And um, how has the community received them? Well, it won't. Now, and that, that's a bad shadow on us if we call ourselves a Christian nation. So if that doesn't get your ire up, I don't know what does, but that's okay. I don't mind causing people to question who they are. Um, and hopefully we can do better. Um, let's see, Derek is an immigrant. I don't know if y'all knew that. And he became a citizen in the United States only in 1985. Our daughter was born in 1984, and it always has kind of tickled her that her father, she's been an American longer than her father has. <laughs> He's younger than her as an American. Um, but we do have our personal filters. We have um, our history of where we came from and what we're bringing into the community. Um, and we also have our personal prejudices that we apply to our understanding of a situation like this. They are displaced, um, Ruth and Naomi, and it affects everything. They are displaced from protection. They do not have um, a, a relative redeemer um, at this point. It's a, a very obscure kind of connection that Naomi has, and it affects everything. Um, it affects their identity, their safety. Um, Naomi's not the same person as she left, and she brings back a foreigner with her. Uh, and it also, I think we need to pay attention to the fact that um, this was a, a bad match that Ruth had had with um, Naomi's sons. We're not supposed to marry Moabite women. Now, this was something that several people ask about. Uh, some of the passages of scripture in the Old Testament that were speaking to the uh, the uh, the that speaks to the um, law against intermarriage, and I and I misquoted some of the text and uh, and I, I wrote it down wrong, <laughs> which means I gave it to you wrong. Now. Um, let me read some of these things as it relates to Moab, especially. Um, Numbers 25, the whole thing. It prohibits marrying Moabite women. Specifically, not just foreign women, but Moabite women. Um, that's in um, Numbers 25. And it's a gruesome story. Uh, it's just awful. Um, in Deuteronomy 23, 1 through 8, mixed blood or foreigners are not welcome in the assembly, in the gathering before the Lord in worship. So how does this stand up to Deuteronomy 10, though? The same book, Deuteronomy. Because in Deuteronomy 10, you find that um, we are supposed to receive fully the widow the orphan and the foreigner who lives nearby with us. Okay. In other words, the book of Deuteronomy is telling us to care for the marginalized in our culture. And that doesn't really jive with coming over here and saying mixed blood, you're not even welcome. <laughs> That's one of the challenges of the Bible, isn't it? So, and then in Ezra 9, there was a deep fear of foreigners because Ezra and Nehemiah were written after they came back from Babylonia, where they had been in exile for 70 years, and now they were going back to their homeland, which had been leveled when they were taken away in the first place. Um, and so they're trying to really stress that we are a people set apart by God. Who are we? And they became very rigid and very literal in their interpretation of the law. There was a fear of foreigners in particular because it would water down the, um, the purity of who they were as people. Um, bad influences might come in and, and destroy what we are trying to claim as our own. So there was a fear of foreigners, a fear of, of loss of identity as Jews. Um, and there was fear of intermarriage. Now, 
land is, let's see, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, I want to say something about land. In Nehemiah, in Nehemiah, in Nehemiah and Ezra, you, you really could should read together. Um, the land that God gave his people, the, the land itself is very important. And the land was portioned out to the different tribes. And that was home. That was where you belonged. Um, it's where your life and identity took place. The land has soil so the land also, you, you'll see the word fields throughout the book of Ruth. The fields produce the nourishment from the land that, that it is found in. It's not so much a nation. It's as your tribal lands, so to speak. Um, and you find reference to that um, in Nehemiah 13, 1 through 3. And of course, the Ezra one in terms of fear of foreigners and the... Um, fear of intermarriage and forbidding it was in Ezra 9. Now, I misquoted last week. I, I said um, it was 1 Kings 4. It's not anywhere close to that. I went, I went and double-checked when one of you questioned it, and um, I, I just thought it was hilarious because it had nothing to do with what we had been talking about. We were talking about the song of Ruth that she, where she pledged her commitment to Naomi in chapter 1. Um, but you see a similar kind of thing in 2 Kings, not 1 Kings, 2 Kings 2, 1 through 14. I must have been recording late at night because that just didn't make sense when I, when I looked at it. It's not even more close to 1 Kings 4. 2 Kings 2, 1 through 14. And it, it's that the seriousness of the covenant language, and you can see how it is... Um, kind of repeated over in the um, book of Ruth. Okay, now, um, hmm. Well, this is interesting. Another thought is that Ruth is creating a family even without a man. And a family was defined by the top dog man in the family, which is interesting. And Ruth kind of is challenging that from the very beginning. Remember in the first chapter when Naomi um, was telling her daughters-in-law, Orpha and Ruth, to go back to their mother's household. That's radical to suggest that a woman has a household is just foreign. <laughs> it, you, you, it was up to the man who provided that, uh, was the language and head of the family. And here we are with Naomi, who's kind of reinterpreting what a family is. Neither one of them have man. And, or a protector, a redeemer protector. Not yet, anyway. But we'll get back to that in a minute. <clears throat> okay, let me see where we are. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. So let's see. Nope, nope, nope. Hmm. One thought that was made in the class that I took was that the book of Ruth was written during a time of immigration crisis. There was a famine. And what do people do when there's a famine? They relocate to find the food they need. In the United States, which was when it was first, um, before we ever existed, they said that whole populations in the West, the Native Americans, would go where the food was. And if there was a famine, they simply packed up and went somewhere else where they could survive. And, it, and this is similar to what they were doing then. They had moved from Bethlehem to Moab um, because of a famine. And then they were moving from Moab back to the house of bread, Bethlehem, um, because things had shifted again. And then immigration comes into play, bringing Ruth back in to that setting. So um, Bethlehem is very male controlled, and we will find out a lot about that in, in uh, chapter four. Um, but it is a, a, an up in the air kind of situation for women. Um, Boaz, 
makes his appearance in this chapter. Boaz is a, a man of wealth, pretty much. Um, his name means worth. W-O-R-T-H. Um, it also can be translated as um, kinsman. Ooh, well, what were they in need of? They were in need of a kinsman, weren't they? And here comes Boaz. Um, worth or worthy is another interpretation of his name. Um, worthy to be a kinsman of these women. Um, but it's someone in the family. He was significant in that family, which was vaguely connected to Elimelech. They were all cousins, I guess. So folks usually married cousins, <laughs> speaking of cousins, um, in the same family, they were usually arranged. You knew who you were going to marry from the time that you were a child. Um, and it keeps the financial secure of a family. Um, it kept the land together because you didn't want to divide the land. It had been apportioned out to your particular tribe, and that was where you wanted to go. Um, remember, it, people lived all over the place, but when it came time, the time of Jesus, they were in Nazareth when all of this happened. Um, and what did they have to do to go and sign up to pay their taxes? They had to go back to their home, meaning to their tribal lands and be registered for taxes. And so they traveled from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem, which was where Joseph, Joseph's kinsmen were from. That was where their land was. Okay, so the married cousins, you have to tell you something funny about this. <clears throat> if anybody knows their American history, they know that during the time of the revolution, there were only about uh, 3 million people in the 13 colonies. That was it. Very sparse, big country, right? Well, um, in Georgia, there were land grants that were given, and there were massive land grants that were given by King, and King George is the one we're talking about several of them actually and so they would go there really weren't a whole lot of people in um, Georgia at that time but it was a colony and people were living there and paying their taxes to the king in England but there weren't that many people to go around and in my family tree especially on the Perkin side they stayed in one place in South Georgia, and, and that's where they still are today in many respects. And they married their cousins. Why? Because there just weren't a lot of women around um, that were of different families. They, it, it just was difficult to, to do that, to find somebody who was of a different bloodline, if you will. <laughs> now, it also caused some problems long-term. Um, on my mother's side, hemophiliac is a real concern. Um, they call them free bleeders. And some of them suggest that it was because they intermarried their cousins. I mean, there are double first cousins in our family as well who married double first cousins. It just, history something, isn't it? Well, one of the um, legends of the Perkins and Evans family on my mother's side was that, um, Oh, what was that one? Wait a minute. My mind does this. See, I wish we were in class together because you could tell me what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Can't remember. Oh, well, I'm sure it was a good story. If I remember it, I'll call you up and let you know. Now, Boaz, we find out, um, was a kinsman redeemer. A man of worth, a man of valor is another way that people have referred to him. He was just a good person, um, and he feared the Lord. Now, Ruth is not um, technically related to Boaz. We know that. But Naomi and Boaz call Ruth daughter. So she's been brought into the family almost as a new human being. Um, 
And we do know that in Ruth chapter 1, she made a covenant connection with Naomi. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. So it's rewriting the boundaries of what a family is. There it is. It's another theme that goes throughout the book. Now, let's see. Hmm. It wants me to go back. Let's see. So that covenant connection, and we are a covenant people. Remember, we, we even uh, have covenant baptism in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, you're included into the household of God. Uh, it's your family, church family. These are languages that we use, and it was also used in the Old Testament. That's what I wanted to tell you. Okay, going back to Ezra and Nehemiah. They are both known for post-exile, like I was sharing with you many years later. Um, Ezra was the one who really started bringing in um, Jewish to protect, his job was to protect the Jewishness of who they were as um, different from all the other nations, which goes back to the first covenant. <clears throat> And the Hebrew people under Ezra were becoming very insular. Um, our country first sort of, sort of thing. Very anti-immigration. Um, it He called for um, an aggressive purity. Um, it was part of who their identity was as a people. A time in which they were determining who they were in God's um, people. And so intermarriage equaled impurity. Um, that kind of gives me chills when I think about Hitler in World War II. Purity of the German race, which isn't a race at all. But um, so this, this was very important. And so the purity of the race of the people had to do with what land you had, the land of the Babylonians, the land of the Hebrew people, the land of the Moabites. That was what delineated your purity. So you have these folks during the exile who married foreign men and women and came back from the exile um, with their foreign wives or husbands and children of mixed breed. So these mixed breed um, individuals who loved God and worshiped God, um, they were suspect and were vilified. Um, so where did they go? They weren't allowed to worship in the assembly because they were impure. Um, and they were shipped up to Samaria, the region of Samaria. And who lived in Samaria? The Samaritans. They were considered a threat to the purity of the Hebrew people and were forbidden to worship in the temple of God. They were unclean. Ooh, you know, it, they were outcast. They were dirty. They were lazy. They were unworthy. Think of any other um, adjectives you might use to describe people that we are prejudiced against. And these are the kind of things that we're saying. They weren't even allowed in church, forbidden to be there. That is not such a foreign concept. Even in the history of our own church, that was the message that was communicated to those who were considered sinners forgetting that all of us are. So it's, it's not a pretty thing. And if it doesn't feel right when it comes to God, it probably isn't. So let's see. There was exclusion. Who's in, who's out. Building a wall, a literal wall, to keep people out. That's what Nehemiah did. So then um, we have in, what is it, chapter two of what? This is two and seven. There are only four chapters in this one, aren't there? I don't know. Oh, 
in chapters two and seven respectfully hmm it included for oh and there's even a scene in Ezra I don't think it's chapter two though I wrote it down it's really interesting new 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 I don't know if it was Ezra or Nehemiah where the men came in who had foreign wives and um, separated from them, sent them away. That, that's how severe it was. It's crazy. Um, hmm. So again, it's how do we view the immigrant and these folks coming home from Babylon, they had immigrant spouses and they were sent back or sent out. Um, now the Moabites, the Moabites had similar language to the Hebrew people, but they had a different accent. You know how you can go to Georgia or any state for that matter, and you can pretty much tell where people were raised based on their accent within um, a given state even. Um, same thing there is that your accent could give you away as to whether or not you were um, foreign or not. And, and in all likelihood, Ruth had an accent that said, I am not a Hebrew woman. So um, that would give them away and that would be cause enough to separate them from the body. Let's see, what is that? So Moab is located, if you get your 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 um, little maps in the back uh, in the time of Judges, and you can see where Moab is, um, that is where, um, it's right next to Israel. It's just kind of over the way. Transportation was very different by then, so if you were traveling by foot, you wouldn't go very far away, and it was a long distance with your own foot. Um, for instance, when Joseph and Mary were making their way to Bethlehem, it was it was a three day constant hard journey. Um, when they were on their way back from the temple where Jesus was twelve and they'd forgotten where he was and couldn't find him, they were already a day and a half away, and they still weren't close to Nazareth, so they had to turn around and go all the way back. Um, so it was hard traveling. And so you can see easily how these pockets of, of accents and people and um, nations, their land defined who they were. Now, hmm, really, nope, 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 nope. Okay. I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote down so many different passages from the Old Testament that informs Ruth. Let's see. Back to chapter two, gleaning. Okay, <clears throat> what is gleaning? Gleaning is gathering. It's, you go behind the harvesters and it was the law to leave um, enough of the, the grain or whatever they were harvesting behind, not to clean out completely when you're harvesting. Why? Because the poor um, and the dispossessed and the vulnerable could come and lean behind. Um, it wasn't necessarily a safe thing to do, but it was the right thing to do according to the law. And it was the way to be graceful and merciful to those who are struggling. So it's, gleaning means gathering. That's, that's all it means. Um, leave the leftovers, in other words, to those who do not have ancestral lands so that they can have something to eat. That's important. Um, I keep, when I think about leftovers, um, there's a tradition in England called Boxing Day. And it doesn't mean you put on your fisticuffs and you go after one another over the family dinner. No, <laughs> Boxing Day was when you had your feasts of celebration at Christmas and you boxed up the leftovers, and you gave it to the people in the in the village, uh, the poor, um, so that they could celebrate with something of value and good food after the celebration in the big house. So that's what Boxing Day was, and 
in a way it was gleaning, uh, providing for the folks who did not have anything. Um, another thing that is interesting about this time, remember they didn't have currency during the time of Ruth, uh, but transactions were made between relationships and the land. And you go, oh, what does that look like? Well, it's different, but we have to remember this expectation that you'll take care of the poor. Um, so there was socially embedded expectations of how we treat the poor in Bethlehem at that time. Um, so when you were talking about transactions of who's going to take care of these people, it was in the relationship. It was in who are you going to marry? Um, who's going to raise these children if the mother dies? Um, and, and you'd go and you the transaction would be making the agreement based on the relationship. And and that is is pretty good, I think. You don't buy them, you, you include them, you bring them in. Um, but there's that expectation. Let's see, in 2-2, <clears throat> it says, and I'm doing the common English, ta-da, ta-da, verse one, Ruth the Moabite, this is where her name changes and she's always got Moabite attached to it, said to Naomi, let me go to the field so that I may glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose eyes I might find favor. In other words, someone who's not going to take advantage of me. And that, you know, I, I'm letting you glean, therefore I want something in return. I mean, it, it's not a very pretty picture. Um, so she's trying to be smart. And so she is telling um, Naomi what she's going to do. To glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose eyes I might find favor. So she wanted to be seen as well, but she wanted to be careful. Um, she wanted to be noticed by someone who would respect her. It'd be good. So she wants to find favor. The first word she says in chapter one and in two two, reversing the particular the um, patriarchy power, if you will. I'm I'm going to do this. It, it, she makes things happen. In other words. There is um, a purpose behind every action that she makes. Um, <clears throat> but she's not a helpless person. No. She's, she's taking charge. She's a gifted woman, and she knows that she's capable of doing more than just surviving. Um, but men are the ones who are supposed to do that. But not, not here. She didn't have any man. And so it is reversing the patriarchy um, power understanding of how things worked. Women didn't really have much. That's why that statement in the first chapter about go back to the households of your mother, that would have made everybody kind of surprised to hear that because it's your father's household, not your mother's. Um, there were a lot of mothers there. <laughs> so she makes things happen. Now in verse five, Boaz notices Ruth right away. Who does she belong to? Language is very important. In other words, who's responsible for her? Um, another part of that question could be, why is she in my field? Who is she? He notices her right away. I have to believe that Ruth must have looked pretty good and very attractive. We don't know that for sure, but we just know that Boaz noticed her right away, <laughs> immediately. Oh, who's that? So I imagine she was likely a beautiful woman who surely belonged to somebody. In verse six is pointed out right away, she's a foreigner. She's Moabite. Um, she came back with Naomi. Um, prior to this, she was just Ruth, um, but now she's also a Moabite. So she belongs, because she belongs to Naomi, came back with her, but she's a Moabite, so she's not really one of us. Language is amazing. So Boaz, in verse 8, runs over to Ruth, 
and talk and tells her not to leave. Um, and you, not to leave. Women on their own were taken advantage of. And Boaz was basically saying, my field is safe. Don't go to anybody else's field. My land is secure and you are going to be secure in it. So don't, don't worry about it. He takes responsibility for her. Just by noticing her, he takes responsibility of her. And, and that's kind of interesting too. And he tells his workers, don't touch her. Talk about vulnerability. It was not uncommon for women to be taken advantage of um, sexually, um, abused physically. It, that, if you didn't have a redeemer protector, that's often was the case of what happened to women. Um, so he tells her not to leave his land, in other words. Glean in my field. Um, and after ordering hands off from his workers, um, let's see. Oh, and this is when he tells the gleaners, I mean, the harvesters to leave more behind so that she will be able to get more food as she comes behind the, the folks who are, are harvesting. In verse 12, God, under whose wings you come to seek refuge, is what he says. Um, wings used in Boaz's cloak, wings over Ruth. And who else has wings do we hear about covering up the hens? Well, God. <laughs> He's even described as a hen who's protecting with her wings the, the children, the little peepers. Um, so let me let me get this into context a little bit more. Oh, let's see. May the Lord reward you for your deed. May you receive a rich reward from the Lord. Um, the God of Israel, under whose wings you come to seek refuge. Isn't that something? And she said, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, sir, because you've comforted me and because you've spoken kindly to your female servant. So she's, that, that word is also translated as slave, even though I'm not one of your female servants. I'm not, I'm not even in your household. So that's, uh, they're, they're really getting to know each other here. And she is just sugar and cream, isn't she? Very smooth. And then at mealtime, Moaz said to her, come over here and eat some of the bread and dip your piece in the vinegar. Um, so she sat alongside the harvesters. And because the gleaners would just sit over, they didn't deserve to be in the company of, of people uh, that were the harvesters, the hard workers. Um, and he served roasted grain to her, and she ate, was satisfied, and had leftovers. And then she got up to glean. And Boaz all ordered his young men, let her glean between the bundles, and don't humiliate her. Don't make fun of her. Also, pull out some from the bales, what you've already harvested for her, and leave them behind for her to glean. And don't scold her. In other words, you're going to have a lesson in how to be generous to someone who is uh, very, very vulnerable. So let's see, verse 12. Oh, that was the wing part, associating how God protects us. Um, hmm. Oh, this is some, it, just the language of it. And, and it, if you're not sure, it, it spells out very carefully the conversation that Boaz has with, with Ruth and it's, it's almost intimate language just oozing with sort of a over-the-top gratitude and I don't know maybe a woman in um, in need. So um, being invited into Boaz's household is basically what he was doing when he had her sit with the harvesters, um, included her in that closer company. Um, food is scarce. Hmm. And why did I write that? I don't know. What does the name Ruth mean again? Do y'all remember what that means? Hold on. 
I have a list. Ruth. Hmm. <laughs> you realize I wrote everybody's meaning down except hers. Oh, mercy. Well, that's funny because here I have a... <coughs> I'll have to research this and I'll let you know next week for sure. But um, Ruth's name, it means fullness, um, abundance in scarcity. And, and that's very telling. Remember, she's childless at this point and Naomi can't have children anymore. Um, but Ruth is abundant in scarcity. And we know that the story ends with her giving birth and the famine is over. So her name basically gives the story away <laughs> before it's over. Uh, she goes above and beyond to support herself and Naomi. And, and that's true. She did this at her own initiative. She wasn't instructed by a, a male uh, redeemer. And Naomi gives of herself for Naomi. She's the one who goes out and does the work and brings it back and brings back more than she could have imagined. Um, let's see. She's referred to as a woman of valor. Um, that's, that's a term that was ordinarily used to describe men. Um, it was used to describe people in leadership. It was men of leadership because women didn't lead. It was used for um, military warriors who went in for the Lord sort of thing. Um, and here's Ruth, who is called a woman of valor. That's, that's very um, rare. It does show up in the Old Testament in one other place in Proverbs 21, where it's talking about the attributes of a good woman. And so a woman of valor is the other place where it is used. And so in, that's Proverbs 21. <clears throat> I don't have the verse down. Um, so in verses 17 through 23 of chapter 2, Ruth brings food to Naomi. And the word that's used there, um, both are satisfied with the meal, meaning it was enough. And they were satisfied, that sense of Fullness, again, is right there. And these these are not words by accident that just happen to be translated in these ways. That's what these words mean. And the layers and layers of what we can see in the text of the of the story um, and how it was written is, is very, very revealing. Now, I've got to hurry up. Um, Ruth is... Um, Can't read my writing. Sometimes I write in tongues. <laughs> Don't know how, what it means. Oh, Ruth, in her actions, is reversing the powerlessness of um, young foreign women, of a young foreign woman. Um, she's not powerless by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, she knows some, but wasn't sure how it would play out. But she knew she had to go glean and a uh, man, a good man. Um, but that in itself provides hope. They were hoping for sustenance. They were hoping for security and protection when they made their um, journey back, and God will provide. That's just a statement that is made. Um, not sure what it would be that he would provide, but the faith that he would. One of you pointed that out in your comments after last week's. Um, and it, and it gives hope. Ooh, we're satisfied now. This gives us hope. We haven't been in this sense of security in a long, long time. Now, in 219, let's see, what does that say? Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you lean today? Where did you work? May the one who noticed you be blessed. <laughs> in other words, you picked a good field to be in right now. Um, so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. So Naomi, I mean Ruth, no, no. Naomi replied to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord who hasn't abandoned his faithfulness with the living or with the dead. 
that's kind of a reflective thought when you think about where they came from. Um, and Naomi said to her, the man is one of our close relatives. Well, he really wasn't that close. Um, he's one of our redeemers, but he did have a stake in what happened to them. And that's important. Ruth the Moabite replied, <laughs> furthermore, he said to me, stay with my workers until they finished all of my harvest. Now, this is great. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it's good, my daughter, that you go out with his young, with his young women so that men don't assault you in another field. Stay with his women, in other words. Um, thus she stayed with Boaz's young women, gleaning until the completion of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Okay, and that's the end of chapter two. So I'm just trying to think, hmm. One of the things that I think in terms of application of this story, again, we, we considered the application of uh, the immigrant in our midst, um, the unwelcome, the Samaritan in our midst that we don't want to include. They're considered unclean. Um, the foreigner in our midst and whoever that may be. And the idea of noticing someone in this chapter, I think, is, is interesting. Who do we notice? Who do we notice? Hmm. Now, in verse, 20, in verse 20, Naomi, bitter, <laughs> that's her other name, she's joy and bitter, says that Boaz is mediating the kindness. Um, he is one of our redeemers protectors. That's what that sense of redeemer is. Of course, we apply that to Jesus too, and that would be a good study to see the, the nuances between the two. Um, so we've identified who the good guy is. We've identified that Ruth is not so vulnerable. She's uh, not powerless by any stretch of the imagination, and neither is Naomi, and they are kind of pooling their, um, their knowledge and their wisdom and, um, and putting it into play in terms of what will secure them more than just food that sustains them and, and fills them and satisfies them, but life itself. And that is where it gets really dicey in um, chapter three. It's called the spicy chapter. Um, and I remember questioning my parents about this when I was a little girl and they did not want to answer it, but you know, we're growing up now. We're going to talk about it next week and 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 see what happens. It's uh, it's it's going to be really good. So stay tuned for next week. Again, thank you so much for sharing in this time together. We went a little bit over time, in my opinion. Um, again, send your comments and and your questions. Oh, oh wait, somebody asked about the year of jubilee. The year of jubilee is a holiday that is in the law. There's that every 50 years, all debts would be forgiven and all land that had been secured would be given back to the tribe that it came from. Um, there is no record that anything like that ever happened, um, actually happened. It was more of an ideal, I guess. Um, I, I think it'd be great if every 50 years we could do that sort of thing. <laughs> but um, our culture is very different today and we don't know that it worked then. Um, but it was a year of great revival, evidently, if it ever happened. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit more about that if you would like. And I'll find that I thought I'd written down where that is actually talked about. I want to say it's in Leviticus, but we'll look at it. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, again, I look forward to hearing some of your thoughts and questions. And I will see you next week. And let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you for helping us to realize that um, you are our ultimate redeemer. You are our, our identity and who we are. You are what represents and reminds us of what we were created for and help us to treasure the relationships we have and to be inclusive in who we notice. Thank you for our time together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week.
I hope to see you on Sunday. Don't forget this coming Sunday, we are going to have in-person worship, nine o'clock downstairs in the CLC, regular live stream um, at 10 o'clock in the sanctuary.